please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please remain standing for a moment of reflection for our servicemen and women throughout the world and for all those who have died in the last week, particularly James F. Considine Barrett, Sr., devoted father, grandfather, uncle, World War II Army veteran, recipient of the Philippines Liberation, Victory, and Asia Pacific Theater Service Medals, and retired Scranton firefighter who served our city for 27 years. Romaine R. Stuckert, beloved mother, grandmother, great-grandmother, sister of our good friends Bob and Bill, and their dear families and friends who suffer their loss. Also, please remember in your prayers Jay Saunders, former city clerk, who was critically ill. please. Mr. McGough? Here. Mr. Rogan? Mr. Laskin? Here. Mr. Joyce? Here. Mrs. Evans? Here. Dispense with the reading of the minutes, please. Third order, 3A, Tax Assessor's Reports, hearing date September 12th, 26th, and 27th of 2012. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. 3B, Audit status from Robert Rossi and Company received October 9th, 2012. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. 3C, Lackawanna County Planning Commission Subdivision and Land Development Evaluations for September 28th and October 2nd of 2012. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. Do we have any cl clerk's notes, Mrs. Craig, tonight? No. Thank you. Do any council members have announcements at this time? Councilman Rogan is unable to attend tonight's meeting. The Little Sisters of the Poor will hold a roast beef dinner this Sunday, October 21st, from 12 to 4 p.m. at Holy Family Residence, 2500 Adams Avenue in Scranton. Catering will be provided by Sterna's Restaurant. Call 343 4065 for tickets and more information. The West Scranton Hyde Park Neighborhood Watch and West Scranton Business Watch Associations will sponsor the West Side Zombie Escape Route 5K Run Walk this Saturday, October 20th at Allen Park, located on the corner of North Main Avenue and Price Street. Registration begins at 7 a.m. and the run walk kicks off at 9 a.m. Admission is $30 or $20 for those on teams of 10 or more. Children seven and under can walk for free with the supervision of a parent or guardian. All proceeds benefit the neighborhood watch. And that's it. Fourth order, citizens participation. <laughs> Our first speaker this evening is Regina Yetkowskis. Good evening, Council. Good evening. Scranton, Regina Yetkowskis, Scranton resident. I'd like to add a little to what you said about the Little Sisters uh, upcoming event. 
Yes. Um, the Little Sisters of the Poor at Holy Family Residence will have their annual homemade roast beef dinner this Sunday, October 21st, from 12 to 4 p.m. at Holy Family Residence, 2500 Adams Avenue, which is adjacent to Marywood College. The dinner will be catered courtesy of Sterna's. Takeout dinners will be available all day. The tickets are $10 for adults and $6 for children 10 and younger. Uh, tickets will be available at the door. And uh, the menu, I'm sure you want to hear about that. The menu includes roast beef, mashed potatoes and gravy, carrots, applesauce, rolls and butter, pie, and assorted beverages. In addition to the dinner, the sisters will have a bake sale, which will include their famous homemade scones and an assortment of other baked goods. There also will be raffles for basket, gift baskets, gift certificates for area restaurants and businesses, and a $5,000 Mount Airy Casino Resort weekend giveaway prize package. All proceeds will benefit the Little Sisters in their mission of caring for the elderly poor with respect, dignity, and love. And I thank you for allowing me to speak. Well, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. It's so good to see you. Nice again. to see you folks, too. Bye now. Our next speaker is Bill Jackowitz. Good evening, City Council. Bill Jackowitz, South Scranton resident, member of the Taxpayers Association. Good evening. Good evening. You know what? This is my opinion, and my opinion only. Honey Bobo would be able to run the city of Scranton better than this, the mayor and the administration is running. The city seems to continue to fall and fall and fall. You know, being a Scranton resident and being a Scranton taxpayer, I think I would rather be, be being a waterboard in Gizmo Penitentiary in prison than being a resident of this city. It is one embarrassment after another. Now I understand that the gas has been turned off in the South Scranton Fire Station. But I also understand that the check is in the mail. Well, you know what? That's not good enough. The check in the mail is not good enough. That's the oldest line in the world. Um, the check is in the mail. Mr. Jackowitz, if I, if I could, I could just comment on that quickly. Sure, go right ahead as long um, as it's on your time. The heat was turned back on this afternoon. Um, it turned out that, uh, <coughs> excuse me, UGI was mistaken and at fault, and they have apologized to the city for the inconvenience. Okay, well, that's good news. Was the bill paid on time? The bill was paid, apparently, yes. It was paid on time? I don't know that it's paid on time because okay. I didn't... Okay, well, that doesn't really matter. The main portion of the thing is that the uh, gas was turned back on. But yes. still, it should never have happened. Never should have happened. You know, if we can't afford, if we can't afford to pay our bills, then you know what? We've had this discussion a million times, and we need to go bankrupt. It's as simple as that. And I know there's people that are going to disagree with that. Now, as far as these loans, I read in the paper that there's five banks willing to give us loans. What's the status on that? Right now, um, as far as I know, there hasn't been a lender um, that has been selected for the TAN. However, uh, I will check with Ryan McGowan and see if he... Because yeah, we were told that the loans will be coming through this week. It's Thursday now. You know? Well, UGI turned off, turned off the gas, whether it was their mistake or not. You know? It's turned off. You know, West Side fire stations are browned out. The people on West Side are very upset. I guess there was a meeting last night at Kaiser Valley. That's the main purpose of government, is to provide for the safety of the people. And guess what? Fire protection is very important. We got fire stations closed and so on and so forth. Unacceptable. Why do we pay taxes? You know, taxes continue to get raised. The county raised taxes. The school district raised taxes. City council and the mayor raises taxes. Uh, the state raises taxes. Federal government raises taxes. Everybody's raising taxes. When does somebody do something for the citizens? 
Minnesota do something for the taxpayers. We live in a city that is distressed. You know what? And it's been distressed for 250 months. Does that, re does that register with you people? 250 months we've been distressed. We've been distressed for 7,587 days. Does that mean anything to you people? Does that mean anything to our elected officials? It means a lot to me. How much longer are the citizens of Scranton going to be embarrassed? Do you know that they're talking about, my nephew lives in Australia. He's the principal of a high school in Australia. Do you know on Australian news they're talking about Scranton, Pennsylvania? A court worker was in Brazil. Do you know on Brazilian news they were talking about Scranton, Pennsylvania? About how inept and how unqualified the, the, the leaders of this city are? Do you think that's nice? Do you think that's something to be proud of? When's it going to stop? When's it going to stop? We're going to borrow more money. We have two more loans pending. We're going to borrow more money for what? We're going to borrow your way out of this? When's someone going to give me a definite answer of when we're no longer going to be distressed? That's what I want to know. What day will this city no longer be a distressed city after 250 months? You know? How much longer? Headline after headline after headline about how screwed up, pardon my language, Scranton is. Every day, city in crisis. It's not a city in crisis. It's really not. The crisis was two, three years ago. I mean, it's got to stop. It's as simple as that. As simple as that. I mean, uh, the commuter tax. The commuter tax, is, this, is the commuter tax going to be the answer? Is that going to is that going to pay all our bills? Is that going to put us out of a distressed city status, or is that just going to alienate us from the other communities in this area? What's it going to do? It's not going to help us because it's not going to pay the bills. It might pay a little bit of the bills. And Mr. McGaugh, I have a question for you. Since you support the University of Scranton, let me ask you a question. If if you would give every neighborhood 10 years tax exemption from paying Scranton taxes. Tax exempt. Do you think the neighbors can beautify their neighborhoods and make their neighbors' neighborhood look as good as the University of Scranton has? Well, I think the neighbors could. Yeah, if they didn't have to pay taxes for 10 years? No. You don't think so? No. Then you don't have very much confidence in your fellow neighbors, do you? Because no. if, they, if they didn't have to pay taxes, I guarantee you they, they would you pave the just roads. Keep talking. Pardon me? Did you want me to answer you or are you just... You just did. Explain? You said no, but go right ahead. Continue well, I was on. going to explain. Because you need, you need somebody to arrange the capital, to bring the capital together to make the improvements. That's what capitalism is all about. You don't think the neighbors can do that? No. There's, no. There's no one smart enough in the city of Scranton or in the neighborhood to do enough. that? Excuse me. I never said smart enough. Well, you said they had to get a range of it. Go ahead, finish. I never said smart enough. I said that... No, those were my words, but go ahead. No, I'm finished. Thank you. No, because you don't have an answer. I, I try to give it so to you. So defend the University of Scranton thank all you. you want. Thank you, Mr. Jackowitz. I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, before I call up the next speaker, I just want to clarify something that was uh, stated uh, by Mr. Jackowitz and um, Councilman Joyce a few moments ago, uh, the, the money to which um, Mr. Jackowitz was referring, the financing specifically, was for a 2013 TAN. Uh, the five banks that are interested attended a pre-bid conference where they can ask questions and receive information. And so the bids themselves, uh, I believe, are not even due yet. And so uh, until that happens and the administration reviews it and decides uh, which bidder is selected, we really don't know anything more than that. But as I said, that is for a 2013 tax anticipation note. And the next speaker is Ron Elman. May 
Yeah, thank you, Council. I have to say that I enter these chambers in a foul mood to start with. I, I buttoned my shirt wrong. Miss Rosie made so much fun of me, she said even the dog was laughing at me. So I told her, I'm just going to wear it like that, but I relented. I, well, all isn't good in Mudville tonight. I was reading poor Austin Burke is so concerned about the city's plight, he believes we need to advocate some reforms. I think he needs to advocate paying for his building permits like the rest of us have to. United Way is so concerned about not making its goals. As I've said before, if they quit supporting ARC, which has a nice bank account of its own, maybe people would give to them. I personally won't, won't give nothing to United Way. It, year after year, we've been hearing that it's coming from the goodwill. I went by there today, I was at the stoplight. There's nothing being done at that school. Uh, I was told by a man that lives across from the school that the city cuts the grass there. I don't know if that's true. That's what he told me at, at a car wash over there one day during the summer. I, I, I can't understand if it is why the city has to cut the grass, but I don't know. Maybe it wouldn't get cut. You know, there's two and a half million dollars unaccounted for. That's all tax money, and, and nobody seems concerned about it. You know, that it's, the state ought to be jumping up and down. Then our very own version of the Three Stooges said yesterday they're going to let 20 people go, but this isn't the same 20 people, the same friends that they just hired, so, you know, th there'd be a problem going on with that. And the SPA is back in the news today. The way they're glued to the city, we'll be hearing about them forever, thanks to the Doherty and the last council. I, I don't know why Doherty just doesn't pack up all that gang of high school buddies and ship them down to Maryland or wherever he built that, that new plant so he wouldn't have to pay taxes here and county taxes and city taxes. You know, if he paid them five dollars an hour, that gang would be overpaid <laughs> after what they've done to the city. And again, there's pages and pages of nonprofits. It's just unheard of gas stations and, and restaurants and bars and doctors, they are not nonprofits. They are just hiding behind the guys. That's where our, we're losing our tax money that the rest of us have to make up. They, these parasites just need to be terminated immediately. Yep, it's not good in Mudville tonight, is it, Jack? <laughs> this bribe taking obscenity of a school board. They're, they're talking about another $17 million school. The, the first school shouldn't have been closed because of mold. Mold is one thing, no maintenance. Nothing else in the world, it's not good maintenance. It's a leak, or a pipe leaking or something. That's why there's over 130 custodians for the school system. This shouldn't happen. I tell you, every last SOB involved in those two closed schools need to be fired. I don't care who it, whose feelings get hurt. They have cost the taxpayers of this city millions of dollars. Now the eventuality of another school and the children being abused and without a home because of no maintenance, and that's, that's why I said they should be fired. I don't, and I know some of them. I've met a couple of them. They still should be fired. I don't care what they think of me. Yeah. Maybe I'm getting too strong, huh? But it, we just built a $17 million school for all those people on Kaiser Avenue that don't pay taxes and won't have to for another couple of years. Now we're talking about another $17 million school. We're a city with no money whatsoever, and the school board just doesn't want to acknowledge it. 
Well, this is quite, this is a shameful disgrace for the people of this city. That, that, that are, it, it, I bet half the people aren't even involved in this system. And I tell you, I had a banker tell me the borrowing has just come to an end. He said he can't think of any more lending agencies foolish enough to give this city any money. And that comes from a banker. That's not coming from me. This, you people have to work with the facts and figures you know are there. You, you just can't keep going on with, with hoping things that change. It's, they're not going to. It's getting harder and harder for the people of this city it, 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 to survive. Thank, Thank you, you. Ms. Evans. Thank you. Thank Did you. you Our next speaker is Ozzie Quinn. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Ozzie Quinn, Scranton. Uh, Good evening. I, Good evening. I want to uh, thank the council for standing up for what you've been doing for the electorate in the city of Scranton. Okay? Uh, I know it's very difficult if you live outside the city of Scranton and you all have friends relatives and whatnot, okay? And uh, I'd be mad too, there's no doubt about it. But uh, I voted for you three, and uh, you know, I'm really happy that you were able to work that out, that you were able to find some solution to part of the recovery plan. And you should be commended for that, okay? And. Uh, uh, you're not the people that should be uh, they should be hollering at. No way should they be hollering at you people. They should be hollering at Mr. Doherty and our old friend the Scranton Times down there downtown, who takes up more space than it needs. Actually, 2003 to 2008, Mr. Doherty spent put millions out that front door, literally millions. No, you know, as I said last week, or two weeks ago, Southern Union was going to be built. Oh, National Gas Company, 4,500 jobs. You know, none of that came to fruition. And you know, the Scranton Times didn't print that story about Southern Union until after the election. Or Doherty might have not won the election. You know, so the people out there in the municipalities I, I feel sorry for you. I really do. But you got to realize that you come in, if you're going to come into the city to work, and you saw earlier, we're trying like heck to keep the safety, uh, uh, protection, the police protection, and fire protection, and health, and the roads open so you can get to work. And uh, it's, it's going to be a tough stretch. So uh, try to bear with the people in the city here. and. Uh, uh, it, we, we got, we got, uh, it's, it's too bad the history books will show that, uh, that uh, Mayor Doherty is, will be the uh, worst mayor ever to uh, be elected in the city of Scranton. If, if it doesn't show that way, then the Scranton Times wrote it, the history. Because of the fact that what he has done to this city, and for, since 2003 to 2008, and I know myself coming up here and telling them about borrowing and borrowing and Mrs. Evans warning about the dirty debt, the dirty debt, and it just um, kept down rolling and rolling and rolling and rolling. And you know, you talk about what he did, the parks. I saw the other day a guy, uh, I read letters to the other and I saw a picture. Somebody went up there to the new park on Green Ridge and tried to go to play tennis and there was a couch on the tennis courts. And they went to the other courts, and there was no nets. I mean, this guy's walking around saying he's doing so much. He had walked around. But you notice lately, of a late, the Scranton Times is putting him in the background. He's fading away, you know? And he's more, and they're more or less bringing new people out. And Janet, you're on the front line out there. I know. This is Evan. You're on the front line out there, as you saw, and, they're, and what they're supposed to have there. 
comic in the paper this morning, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, one of the liners should be on one the end there because he, well, they, they're, they're responsible for a lot of what went on for, uh, in the city of Scranton. There's no doubt about it. Uh, they, you know, I speak with other people and uh, it's not just myself, other people, they're, they're starting to become aware of it. I think you know, the artists that they showed in the last Sunday Times and, and the week before that, that they're decreasing their circulation has decreased. It's showing that people are starting to realize, you know, that the paper is just a bunch of uh, spin on their own feelings and then get what they want off the net, the same thing, okay? So try to keep up the good work, and I know it's very difficult under the circumstances, and you're gonna have a lot of people out there, you know, hollering and cursing and everything else, but, uh, you know, you be commended, and I really thank you, okay? Uh, th I voted for you, so you would protect me, and that's what you're doing. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Les Spindler? Good evening, Council Les Spindler, City Resident, Homeowner, Taxpayer. Good evening. Uh, last week, quite a few people came here talking against the commuter tax. And, uh, it's been said here before, we've been distressed for 20 years. I find it hard to believe the people that live in this city would come here and criticize a revenue source that would help possibly get us out of the distress status. As Mr. Jackwood said, it won't get us out of the distress status, but it, it will help. Anything that comes into the city is a help. And I can't believe someone who lives in this city would be against that. I could see if you don't live in the city, yeah, but if you're a citizen in the city, anything, any amount of money coming into the city is going to help. And uh, I think this council is doing a great job. That's one step they're taking. What happened with the parking authority was another step. So it shows the council's doing their job. And I have the opinion of a commuter. I just recently spoke to a prominent doctor. I asked him what his opinion of the tax was. And he said, well, if the money is mismanaged the way it has been for the last first eight years of Chris Thornton's administration, then he said, I'm against it. But he said, if it's put to good use, he said, I, I'm all for it. He said, I wouldn't mind paying it. And he had examples of the mismanagement. He said, we didn't need a tree house, which many of us came and spoke against. We don't need the electric city sign lit up every night. How much money that's costing us on electricity, I have no idea. But this doctor said, and like I said, he's a commuter. He said, if it's put to good use, he has no problem paying it. And I have every faith in this council that it will be put to good use since they've taken Chris Doherty's checkbook away. Uh, uh, next thing, the railroad bridge on Main Avenue went between West Side and North Screen. I think everybody knows about that. Trucks are hitting that left and right. The last two weeks, last week and this week, just a few days ago, trucks got stuck. And uh, it's, it really causes havoc there with traffic. And, whether we need more signs or bigger signs, I don't know what the problem is, but it's almost a weekly occurrence anymore. And uh, so something's got to be done. Like I said, it, like, I'm not an engineer, but it's my opinion where when that bridge takes a hit, it's got to be weakened. And I've spoken about it in the past, how the supports that are holding that bridge up are all rusting out. And I know council did send a letter to the railroad. I don't think you ever heard anything, but. I just, I drive by that every single day. I go underneath that. And the, the supports are all rusted. There's actually holes and parts missing. So I, I don't know. I, I can't believe that that's safe. Uh, that's all on that. On a good note, last couple weeks I've seen a couple new police cars driving around. They're pretty spiffy looking. <laughs> so uh, I hope they stay that way for a while. And it's, it's nice that we have some nice cars on the road now. Now we need more police officers on the road and firefighters. And while I'm talking about firefighters, I was really disturbed to hear what Councilman Laskin was talking about last week. The way our firehouses that, that aren't being used are deteriorating. It's really disturbing that uh, he's, what he says, that with rats being in there and the, the place is just deteriorating. There's no excuse for this. And there's one man to blame. And we all know who that is. The man who resides downstairs. And uh, something's got to be done. 
And uh, like I said, everybody came to this podium saying you never should have returned that money from the Safer Grant. And, you know, he said in two years he can't pay you unemployment. Well, we don't know what's going to happen in two years. Maybe we'll be in much better shape. And I told the mayor that. I questioned him when he was here that night. And he told me, I said, well, you might not even be here in two years. With the hope of God, he won't be. Because if he is, then we're really in deep trouble. But uh, something's got to be done. These firehouses got to be kept up. And we need firemen in there to keep them up. Uh, that's all I have to say tonight. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Doug Miller. Good evening, Council. Doug Miller, Scranton. Good evening. Um, good evening. I'd like to uh, spend tonight by addressing the uh, meeting that was held back at Kaiser Valley uh, by the association uh, regarding the closing of Engine 7. Uh, as a West Grant resident, I did attend this meeting and participated uh, in the question and answer segment. And uh, I think anyone that was in attendance, uh, including Councilman Laskum, could attest to the fact that uh, it was a pretty heated meeting. The tempers did flare. It was a passionate discussion. Uh, the bottom line is people are totally disgusted that for the months of July, August, and September, 82% of the time, Engine 7 has been closed. And the first question that the majority of the people had for Chief Davis, who was in attendance, was why was the station closed and who made the decision to close it? And Chief Davis stated on numerous occasions that he was the one that made the decision to close Engine 7. He was then asked what made him make that decision. And he stated that they went by a study done that went back 10, 15 years that analyzed fires that took place in West Scranton. And that's how they determined what stations to close. I find that explanation to be totally ludicrous and absurd. We're taking a look at fires that took place in the past and using that as our reasoning to determine what stations we're going to close, as if we have some crystal ball where we can predict when fires are going to occur. I believe a statistic was stated last night that 33% of our population in the city of Scranton is based out of West Scranton. And Chief Davis went ahead, a West Side resident himself, made a decision to close a station that, as I stated, has been closed 82% of the time over July, August, and September. And today it's still closed. He then went ahead to say that he continues to fight daily, walking into the, marching into the mayor's office, urging him to reopen it. I found that to be quite, quite odd. I found the chief to sort of talk in circles for most of the evening, and I did question him on that. That in one sentence he's saying he made the decision to close Engine 7, and then in the next sentence he's saying he's in the mayor's office urging him to reopen it. Well, if he made the decision to close it, then common sense would tell you he would have the ability to make the decision to reopen it. So his reasoning behind it is, as I stated, absurd. There's no justification for it. It's stupidity. The second issue that was brought up was the SAFER grant. I believe it was initially, we only expected to receive, and I'm sure you can correct me if I'm wrong, in the neighborhood of $600,000. Am I correct on that? It was, it was in that area. I, I, I do recall that. The federal government came in and said, here's $8 million where you now have the ability to maintain a full complement of firemen and keep our stations open. What do we do? We say, you know what? We don't want all of this. Take $3.5 million of it back in that area. We don't want it. The chief was asked this question, why would you give three and a half million dollars back? Or well, we're worried two years from now, what are we going to do? No, we're not worried about two years from now. Two years from now, we worry about that situation when we get there. We need to worry about the present. And the present right now is that you've jeopardized the health, safety, and well-being of the residents of this city, including myself, everyone in attendance at that meeting last night, and every other of my one of my neighbors in Westside. You've done this. And then you're going to stand before us last night and tell us that you care? And I stated this right to his face. I told him that he doesn't care because his actions prove it. The mayor doesn't care and Chief Tom Davis doesn't care because if he cared, Engine 7 would be open today. So his political rhetoric that he spewed last night was nothing more than the, the rhetoric he hears from the mayor every day. I'm sure he was given specific orders on what not to say and what to mislead the public on. We were also made aware that initially when our stations were shut down throughout the city, our firemen, who looking out for the, the residents of this city, because that's what they do, put signs up at all the stations that were closed. 
to notify the public that your station was closed today and that you should call 911 if there's an emergency. Chief Tom Davis ordered that those signs be removed. Does this sound like an individual, a fire chief, who cares about our safety? I don't think so. He could stand before me and say whatever he wants. He does not care. There's no justification for giving back three and a half million dollars. He blamed, he had, his answer for everything was economics. And I, I sort of found that amusing as well because we want to talk, we want to cite economics, yet we're giving free money back. So his, his rhetoric was certainly uh, insulting. His lack of information was insulting as a fire chief. He had an inability to answer most of the questions. He was uh, asked what study was done. Who did the study? Where is it? Can we see the study? He didn't have an answer on that. I'd like to see that study. And I know all those in attendance would like to see that as well because 82% of the time, that station's closed. And as I believe was stated last night, I believe Councilman Alaskum stated it, and he's absolutely right. The mayor and Chief Davis, they must have guardian angels up above looking after them because I'll tell you what, they're lucky nothing major's happened catastrophic over there because when that, does, when that day does happen, and I'm, for, I'm, I'm praying that it doesn't, but God forbid something tragic does occur over there. I will hold Chief Davis responsible, as I did state him to him last night. I looked him right in the eye and said, I will hold you accountable for your actions and Chris Doherty for your actions. But the bottom line here is they don't care. And they could say what they want. They could blame it on economics. The bottom line is you had $8 million. You gave three and a half of the back. The fact that we could staff Engine 10 on East Mountain with overtime, knowing full well that Engine 7 is closed, there's no excuse for it. And I'm not saying what East Mountain isn't entitled to service, protection, they are. But when you know full well that 82% of the time West Side's not protected and you go ahead and do what you do, there's no justification for it. You know, today we find out that Engine 2, the gas was shut off, and I understand it's been turned back on. But the point still is, though, it happened, and we let it happen. We have no problem paying the electric bill up at Niagara for those Christmas lights, though, or the electric city sign. But when it comes to the essentials, we lack. And that's because the administration does not care. Thank and they need to be held accountable once and for all. And the people can no longer tolerate it. They need to come forward and demand that Engine 7's open. I'm looking out for West Side and my neighbors, and I won't stand for it. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Lee Morgan. Good evening, Council. Good evening. Good evening. Um, I guess my opinion usually runs counter to most people's, but <clears throat> I really appreciate the study and the questionnaire that the Chamber of Commerce gave and the results they've received. And I totally believe that the commuter tax is unjustifiable and most certainly wrong. I just find it really troubling when someone decides that someone who lives in another community <clears throat> should make up for mismanagement of government, of someone else's government. Um, you know, people saying, well, we need the money. No, what we really needed was a government that understood that people's pockets are only so deep and that um, this, the problems facing the city have uh, been ongoing for a very long time. I'd like to go into the Scranton Times archives in the near future and look back at the time when the last Home Rule Charter was written because I believe when you read the Charter, the Council had the ability from the date of inception of that Charter till today to make the tough choices and to and to really change the city's fiscal course. And it didn't happen. Now, we can all point fingers, and, uh, but I think it's time to live in a world of reality. Um, you know, PEL hasn't done us any favors. I'm, I'm hoping that the banks refuse to loan the city any money because I'm thinking that they'd be doing us a favor and they'd be doing something that I think council should have done. 
I think counsel should have proceeded and tried to go forward with bankruptcy. I think that when you uh, see the people in this city living in poverty and asking them for more money, which they already do not possess, and it's already been discussed many times this chamber, in, in this chamber, the wage base in the city seriously diminished. Um, I really, uh, I think it's time for everybody to really open their eyes. You know, I was at Garrity's today, standing next to a woman at the meat case, and uh, she just couldn't believe the price of things and uh, how diminished her life has become. And she didn't make a comment about council. She made about a comment about government in general. Government is completely out of control. It's no doubt that Washington has cut funds that used to come to the city at one time. It's also a fact that uh, federal elected officials gave all our jobs to other countries. That's a fact. We've worried about the rich and the people with access to the halls of power. We had a discussion tonight. Somebody brought up the North Scranton Junior High School. I think it would be a great thing for people to go into the Scranton Times archives and see what happened when that building left the ownership of the Scranton School District and the amount of money that Mr. McDade came forward for that project. And really what's happened here is the ordinary people have lost their voice. Really, maybe, you know, Mr. McGough talked about capitalism, but I really think that people need to read some history and find out what kind of nation we actually have and if we do in fact actually function as a capitalistic society because I think the people here may be shocked. We talk one thing but we do something else. And in regards to the Scranton Parking Authority, that fiasco is still ongoing. And I think, in my opinion, and only my opinion, that this commuter tax should never, ever, ever come to be realized. This city has to dig itself out. It dug itself in. Lack of political leadership is not an excuse. Blaming the Scranton Times, well, you know, you can blame them, but they print a newspaper. The people who live in this city go outside their door and they can see what's occurring here. And an informed citizen, they may not be in this council, but they should try to find things out that are factual. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Dave Dobson. Good evening, Council. Dave Dobson, resident of Scranton. Uh, good, evening. Good, evening. good evening. One thing I wanted to report right away, I missed John at one meeting last week. I was busy. Uh, last uh, two weeks ago, there were some kids jumping out in front of cars on the South Scranton Expressway coming home from school. And they were joking around that I stopped and I said, you shouldn't do that. They said, well, we're trying to get some insurance money. I told them I was driving without insurance. But, you know, uh, if anything could be done with the police to watch out for stuff like that, somebody's going to get hurt. Also, the person, that poor jerk that hits them, be in a lot of trouble. Uh, first of all, I like to start out that we have the government we voted for. And for years we voted so. And somebody got elected as mayor, and that's the way it is. Uh, no doubt that he didn't fill the ballot box with uh, personally signed receipts, so uh, people of Scranton should uh, be willing to pay their taxes. And the people that donate uh, to uh, small races to this town from out of town, they don't have any right to complain about a uh, commuter tax because I personally believe that all of these corporations and interests, if they're going to donate a hundred million dollars to a presidential campaign, then maybe they can afford to pay some more taxes. Uh, that's the way I see it. Um, 
and I've been reading some of these comments on the this uh, commuter tax and uh, uh, in reality I would wish that these people would uh, petition their state representatives to one restore the revenue sharing to this town that's been taken away and number two uh, to uh, we have a state constitution here that requires us to just sit by idly while one, one uh, tax exempt after another moves into the city or buys property up and it's not just the you uh, a lot of speeches have been oh, we have Lackawanna Junior College Johnson Tech has always had a lot of uh, space Johnson College uh, they had what 60 acres or something like that and they were founded in the early 1900s so but uh, I'd like to see pilots from all of them and the Pennsylvania Association of Nonprofit Organizations has to uh, start to relate to these people that if a city becomes unsafe uh, it's, it's uh, not in their institutions but their interests uh, at all uh, you could have students being preyed upon by criminals and so forth and we've seen it uh, we've seen it uh, I offered somebody a ride up in the hill section one night back when uh, Biden was uh, in town and I don't know why they didn't take me up on it and I picked up the paper the next day and three hours later somebody had a broken nose and had been robbed in the same neighborhood they were parking their cars up there so they didn't have to pay uh, the exorbitant uh, uh, parking fees and so forth so you know it, they're kind of a, a, it was just uh, I warned them about going up there it's after dark and somewhere around Monroe and Vine Street somebody uh, somebody got robbed and uh, I had a novel idea with the school board listening to my buddy Ron here uh, why don't we zone out flat roofs for schools in this town you know we we should just make it against zoning board laws uh, McDickles Plaza I had a neighbor his his kids are in their 30s right now and uh, uh, they started at McNichols Plaza after they're in second grade and for the whole time that they went to McNichols Plaza the roof leaked it's a flat roof and I was walking by there one day with Pooch and uh, I seen a, a tarp on the top and a bunch of stones piled on it so it probably would still leak if you removed that tarp you know just he needs a new tarp uh, it's really but uh, this tax situation we really need to zone in these uh, these nonprofits and so forth, and that's all there is to it. That's the only answer. They're taking over Adams Avenue now. Uh, okay, uh, and one further thing with the school board. I think the next time I go to vote, it's just going to be for none of the above, <laughs> and that's all there is to it. Uh, since Sada. Uh, engineers forced to train Chinese outsourced so the company could be outsourced uh, Chinese replacements owned by Bain Capital and we all know who owns Bain Capital by now and uh, I guess uh, the name is Des Jardis or something like that from uh, Tennessee is a state center pro-life tea party doctor demanded his fourth mistress get an abortion <laughs> it was on the news shame 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 I mean you know he's probably signed that pledge to ban uh, hormonal contraception thank you and have a good night bok, thank bok. you thank you is there anyone else who cares to address council Good evening, Council Marie Schumacher. Good evening. Um, on 7A, I have a, a, an issue with it. That is, I, I checked the Pennsylvania Secretary of State's Corporation's website today, and they have no 520 Madison Avenue Associates LLC, though they do have a 520 Madison Associate, Associates LLC. 
The county assessor's website shows the 520 Madison Avenue property is owned by Madison and Vine Associates. So my question then, <coughs> excuse me, is the loan going to a corporation other than the owner of the property, uh, perhaps uh, a leasee for purposes of operating the bed and breakfast? And if so, what is the length of the lease as, as at least, is it as, at least as long as the loan repayment schedule? Anybody know? From the narrative that I received from OECD, it is a property that is owned by Mr. Nasser, who was here um, a few months ago, I guess, uh, you know, speaking to it. Um, and I believe that he is the owner and going to be the operator of the bed and breakfast. Okay, that is well, my understanding. Well, it, it just it just seems strange to me that the Secretary of State has that we're doing a, a doing business with an LLC that's not listed uh, in the Secretary of State as a valid corporation. So, <laughs> for what it's worth, um, you know. Uh, also, I notice a large increase in the number of properties owned by limited liability corporations. Uh, does this limited liability impede such things as enforcing blight legislation for property or collecting unpaid balances on CDBG loans if the endeavor goes belly up before the loan is satisfied? No answer. Okay. Uh, speaking of CDBG loans, I do hope we'll have that, that list tonight and Mrs. Evans will speak to it when she returns. Um, also, adding insult to injury of the commuter tax being rammed through all three readings last week, I opened Monday's Times Tribune to find almost five inches of legal notice announcing that the city would be voting on the commuter tax on October 25th, even though it was rammed through last week. Legal notices are not inexpensive. When you have half a million dollar cash on hand and almost seven times that amount in outstanding bills, we shouldn't be wasting expensive advertising dollars on debt issues. Uh, now for a couple of follow-ups. Uh, Mr. McGough, do you have the uh, current number of rental properties in the database? I do not. Okay. I have not checked back. Okay, uh, maybe you could do that for next week. But you know, I'm really astounded that probably the largest percent of likely rental properties could readily be obtained by simply asking the county IT department to provide a list of property owners with improvements whose billing address does not match the property address. Can you please tell me why this has not been done? Mr. McGough? I'm sorry. I was, I was looking for the Madison yeah. Avenue thing. No, um, the, no. Why have, as I say, most of the, the properties that are owned by out of state or are some are rental properties the bill goes to a different address than the property. And I know that the county has been willing to provide that list to the city, and why haven't we asked for that? That's probably over 80% of the properties. I don't know that we haven't. I don't know that we have. Could you find out for next week? I will. Thank I you. I will ask. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Joyce, back to you. Budget time must be coming. Um, two weeks ago, you offered to obtain the information I requested on how close we are to our uh, unit, our ceilings under the Unit Debt Act. Uh, do you have that information for me this evening? Yes, uh, I was looking into this, and I also uh, spoke with our business administrator about it uh, via email and um, conversation, and. He said the general obligation debt that we could borrow is roughly $35 million, and the general obligation debt that the city could borrow with leasing or subleasing is roughly $90 million. <clears throat> I, I'm going to actually go back to him and ask him for some more clarification on that. Well, yeah, I mean, that, yeah, I, I know that's about what I estimated on the 35, I mean, at the 35 on, on, on what our billing amount is, but the, uh, I'm just wondering where we're going to be when we get all these loans for this year combined with the loans for last year, and of course we would have that if we had an audit, but since we don't seem to be able to produce an audit, it, it goes by the wayside, I guess, but. 
maybe you could get where we are now and what our general obligation principal amount is currently and what it will be after we obtain this year's funding, not next year. Um, on, April, on March 29th of this year, I provided the case law regarding commercial operators of government-owned uh, facilities and their obligation to pay property taxes. Uh, three weeks ago, I inquired how far along you are in investigating this issue, which you said you were, uh, which could increase annual property tax revenue by about half a million dollars. And I'd like to know, where does your investigation stand as of this evening? I'm still working on that. I, I apologize. Do you, do you plan to have it before the, um, the budget this year? Yes, I'm, I'm hoping to. Thank you. Okay, now, reading from the October 4th council meetings, uh, in regard to the real estate tax collection so far this year, the tax office has collected and distributed roughly $11.9 million uh, in, in current yeah. real estate taxes. However, the last time I checked, um, August preceded October, so I'd like to know why the controller's report for the month of August records $13.7 million uh, in real estate income. Uh, could you please explain, and, and when, can, when you compare the 2012 to the 2011, uh, do you, last week, uh, or two weeks ago, I think, you noted that it was like 8.4%, this year's collections were 8.4% over. Does that include the millage increase for this year, or is, the mill is it an apples to apples, 2011 to 2012? Well, that is what the millage increase. It, oh, okay. So it's, it's really not comparing apples to apples. The millage was increased by 4.8% or 4.9%, so you would expect a 4.9% increase in, in uh, collections, but the uh, increase in collections was, I, I believe it was 87 off the top of my head, it was somewhere well, that in that was general that was back range. on the fourth of October that it was eight point four. So yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'll save the rest for next week. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank hey, you. I just uh, I, I Ms. Schumacher, I did find the note that we got from OECD. Uh, it says five twenty Madison Avenue Madison Avenue Associates LLC is a new four unit bed and breakfast located at five twenty Madison Avenue which is owned and operated by William K. Nasser, Jr., CPA. So that's what I'm basing, you would know. You, the, would, would you repeat, that's the same, what was the, the name of the corporation? 520 Madison Avenue Associates. Okay, but LLC. as I say, the only thing, that the Secretary of State's website says 520, they have no 520 Madison Avenue, but they do have a 520 Madison Associates LLC. And before we execute a, a loan agreement, I think we should check to make sure we have the correct, uh, the correct name of the corporation, and it is a valid corporation in the in the Commonwealth. Thank you. Thank you. Jack, you handsome devil, you. Chrissy. <laughs> Hi, James. Hi, Chrissy. Well, tomorrow night, Jack, we'll get whooped tomorrow. You know that. <laughs> well, what's the one thing in the other Jack? Hey, Frankie. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna win it this year, but right now. We're not going to win it this year. Maybe next year, Frank, but not this year we won't. <laughs> next year. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Chrissy. Chrissy. Is there anyone else who cares to address council? Andy Sprague, Susan Scranton, Fells Grantonians. Good evening. Good evening. As you know, you plan to pass this commuter tax. If the court's okay, it, it will go into effect. Who is exempt from paying this tax? Federal judges? County judges? People who work in the courthouse? People who work in the federal building? I want to know who is exempt from this tax, not who has to pay. I'm more concerned with that cleaning woman that's gonna get hit with this no matter what. But I wanna see it implemented fairly across the board to everybody that works in Scranton. If you consider the federal judge, federal employees not working in Scranton, but in the, uh, in the federal building, then they would be exempt. 
And that's the important things about this whole commuter tax, that it be imposed if it is imposed fairly. On principle, I can't find favor in it. But the principle isn't really going to make much matter if the courts approve it. But the exemptions are. And I believe that should be spelled out. Somewhere along the line, the exemptions from this commuter tax be spelled out. So the people across the area is going to be affected by it. We'll have a chance to either say something one way or the other, or at least know it. I hate to see that poor cleaning woman get hit with all this tax and a federal judge walk away, or a county judge walk away, or the commissioners walk away and say, we don't have to pay it. That's only for the peons, not for the elected officials. This is the important things about any tax. It has to be fair. And the thing you got the tax report from the Sayers office down there. And a lot of properties were reduced. And if this is, you know, two weeks reduction of about 35,000, how many properties were reduced within the last four years or five years? That's your tax base. Not only do you blame the university, okay, they're eating up properties. The nonprofits are eating up properties. But people going to the tax assessor's office and getting their tax lowered are eating into our base. At one time, they were going to send somebody down there and actually uh, represent the city anytime somebody came up for a reduction. I don't know what happened to the plan. That was quite a while ago. Judy Gitelli was there at that time. I guess it never really got that far. But at least you do get the report. But like I say, when you get the report, it's already done deal. There's nothing you can do about it. And the worst part about it is, if you went back to them people who reduced them taxes and say, where is the backup? Where is the the information they gave for you to reduce these taxes, it's not, it's not existed. I went down there one time and tried to find out some of that information. And he said it don't exist. They don't keep records other than what they gave you of the backup of the reason why it was done. And that's important too. That's what's wrong, what's happening. That's why they consider Scranton to be corrupt. And I can understand that. Fairness in taxes is the cornerstone of a democratic republic. And if you have no fairness in taxation, we might just go to a dictatorship or back to the old serf system, because we're heading that way as it is, I'm sorry to say. I always said this a long time ago. I was more afraid of Washington than I was afraid of Moscow. And that was at the height of the Cold War, because Washington would do a lot more damage to you that Moscow could have ever. Because anybody common sense knows in the atomic war there's no winners anyway. And they always said that. Your government is your enemy. Your weapon is your vote. You gotta utilize that vote to maximum. If you don't, we're in for a decline. And as you can see, we are declining. I don't people have to reason. When you vote, don't vote on a name. Don't vote on a party. Vote on the individual and everything you can find out about that individual. And usually by talking to a neighbor, a friend, even an enemy, you'll find something about that individual. And then when you cast the vote, you cast a more intelligent vote. Where we are now, as you can see, we haven't been very smart on our voting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Francis, Granton. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. I hope Pat Rogan is feeling better. Uh, I just wanted to give a different approach here. Uh, I respect Neil Schumacher and Lee Morgan, but I, I just have to disagree completely with what their views are on this commuter tax. Uh, they seem, or Lee seems to think that bankruptcy is the idea. Well, I don't think these commuters would have to worry if the city went bankrupt. They wouldn't have a job to go to. Some, some places would probably close up. But also, if you live in this city, you should, you should hope that 
our city council and our government is doing everything we can to keep our taxes down. Now, without this commuter tax, our taxes would probably ri raise, and uh, we simply can't afford it. So I, I can't comprehend people who live in the city not wanting this. Uh, how about uh, entertainment? The people from out of town, what do they do? They go to the parks, New York Park, they go to the parks in Scranton, they go to the cultural center, they go to the museum. That's in Scranton. They come here all the time. New York Park at Christmas time, they go to the hospitals, they go to their doctors in Scranton. Not only that, the DPW plows the streets in Scranton that these people come to work on so they can get to work. So, I mean, all these services that they seem to take for granted and they don't realize, same with the fire and police, 24 hour you know, protection. Sure, maybe some of them weren't in a fire, but thank God they weren't. But if they were, the police and firemen would be there to help them on our dime. So I don't think it's asking that much. I myself go to different towns and stuff for lunch and stuff like that. Other people, and we have our mall that they come to. We, we go to their towns, they come to our towns. That's the way it should be. It should be one big help each other out. And I'm sure we would do that for them if we could. So I just think that this should be a, a different approach and that people should try to see why this commuter tax is very important. I mean, you're doing your best to try to keep the taxes down as low as possible, and I appreciate it. So I hope it goes through, and, and I hope people remember all the services. And there were just a few. There's many, many more. Their children go to the University of Scranton, like going to college, Johnson School. That's in Scranton. How about that? They're here all day long. So think about it twice before you say they don't get anything from Scranton. They get far more from Scranton than we get from other little towns. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Joe Talamini, recently returned to Scranton and a registered voter. Good evening. Uh, Good evening. Welcome back. I've been here on many occasions. Thank you. And uh, I've seen you people get hammered left and right, and I've done it myself on occasion. Of course, I had much more fun with the previous council, but. Uh, the only thing you haven't been blamed for so far is what happened in Libya and why the gas prices were up so high, and I think, you know, you ought to be accountable for that, too, but that we'll say that for another day. Personally, I think the biggest problem with this town is something that is obvious to everybody and nobody wants to admit it, and that's this town is still run by the good old boy network and by this ridiculous home rule charter where you people don't have any power. The power goes to the mayor, and he has dictatorial powers. And I'm glad to see that in the past year, you've at least gotten someplace with him. You forced his hand. But you know, quite frankly, I've seen him on two occasions in public. The other times, he's at the Chamber of Commerce, and those people don't vote for him. I, I'm sure they give him the money. Uh, but I don't know what he does. I just came back from the South. I spent 14 months down there, and I attended 16 different city council meetings. And they all have a mayor and council form of government. They all have a pay-as-you-go plan. And these are the people who are supposed to be so backward. My God, they are light years ahead of us. For the simple reason that every agency in the city is accountable to the public, and they attend council meetings. There is not a, an agency in this city that should be exempt. And it's nice that, you know, the finance people go to Mr. Joyce. But Mr. Joyce also works full time. And Mr. Joyce doesn't have the option to sit there and understand these things. I think everybody who gets any money from the city should be here to account for it, to the public. Every agency, and that includes the fire department, the police department, the city clerk, everybody. Everybody who deals with public funds should be accountable to the public and should be required to attend a meeting. And you're not going to do this until you get a mayor and council form of government where you have equal authority. Now, as it is right now, you're technically a legislative branch. But how far can you push legislation? Only so far. We all know that. Your hands are tied. You have to play games. And again, we go back to the good old boy network. And I just recently noticed that one of the schools, they signed off on one of the schools. And the gentleman in charge who has had several previous jobs within the city, I don't know what his qualifications are for the present job, didn't even know which school he signed off on. That's ridiculous. Come on, if you're paying a guy 50 or 60 grand a year, he ought to know who the hell he's signing off on. These kids are going to that school. 
Fortunately, I understand that they started moving the kids out of the school. But this is the thing. Somebody's got to be held accountable. As it is right now, the mayor is accountable. The mayor does not appear at these meetings. Nobody from any of the agencies appears at these meetings. You have no idea what's going on. You saw the fiasco with the Scranton Parking Authority. The sewage authorities in the same situation. Every agency in this community. And who is accountable? Who tells the public what's going on? Nobody. I can come up here and ask any one of you questions. You have to get answers because you don't have them. And that's not right. That is not what government is about. It's about time, and I am proposing right now, that the citizens of this community get together to repeal the Home Rule Charter and enact a mayor and council form of government, because that's the only way you're going to solve this problem. You need accountability. You need transparency. Right now, you don't have it. So as I said, I, I apologize that you don't have the an answers on Libya or the high gas prices, but I'm sure that one of you can come up with it for next week. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who cares to address council? By <coughs> Bay, motions. Councilman McGough, do you have any comments or motions this evening? Very quickly tonight. Uh, just uh, one item from the uh, meeting with the Pennsylvania Economy League on Monday. It was talk came up about you know the implementing various parts of the recovery plan. And one of the things that did come up was the fact that um, there were three things in the recovery plan for which council had kind of basic responsibility, uh, or some responsibility, the amusement tax, real estate transfer tax, and I'm missing the third one, Mrs. Craig. Uh, there were three at the top of the page, and I forgot to bring the implementation. But anyhow, if, if you could think, I don't. Um, there were three, and I had mentioned it before, but one of the things that was mentioned was that these passage of these three prior to appearance in court for the commuter tax would probably be a good thing to do, since one of the things that the judges will look at is whether we have exhausted other revenue streams. Uh, so it was just a, a comment that was made, and um, I know uh, Mr. McGowan mentioned that uh, the legal office was working on some of this, but uh, you know, perhaps uh, we should you know, move it along, try and move it along a little bit so that we can get this done um, you know, prior to appearing in court. Um, I'll just respond that I did talk to the mayor about these issues uh, throughout the last week and uh, at the top of my list was the amusement tax and um, I requested that the city solicitor would draft the legislation and send it to us as soon as possible because you know I had mentioned to the mayor we need to keep to a timeline and I think it's something also that must be included in the budget mm -hmm. and um, he agreed, and he does have Mr. Kelly at work on it. So I'm hoping that we should receive that for either next week's meeting or the following week. Thank you. And that was all I had for tonight. Thank, Thank you. you very much. And Councilman Loscom, do you have any comments or motions? Uh, yeah, just briefly, I just wanted to uh, touch on, uh, I believe, Mr. Miller. Uh, mentioned it at the podium this evening that there was a meeting in Kaiser Valley last night uh, concerning the lack of uh, fire protection on the west side uh, more importantly Luzerne Street station being closed uh, the majority of the time and the conditions of the buildings because of the closures uh, it was a pretty interesting meeting last night uh, there was some slight contentiousness but uh, a lot of facts were laid out uh, the public got to ask questions. Um, I do appreciate the fire chief for attending the meeting and, and answering the questions. And our deputy chief was there with, uh, you know, with a lot of facts and figures. And um, and of course, uh, there were members of the fire department, residents of the west side, 
uh, particularly to West Mountain too where there is no water for fire protection and uh, now that we're getting into the heating season it's it's getting even more uh, you know important that we have protection over there and and I don't think the people in Kaiser Valley were looking to one step in the other part of town they were just they're just wondering why they are closed I believe the the, the figures were 88 percent 12 percent they're open 88 percent of the time that station is closed and no other stations are closed that amount of time you know if it's going to be fair if it's going to be roving brownouts then every stage there should be a rotational pattern um, you know we're rolling the dice as it is we've rolled the dice with the closings up to this point west side is a massive area the whole city should the, the protection that we had previous with all the stations open worked adequately for years and years uh, to change that and, and again there is no actual study that they used they used the dartboard method which I stated before um, you know they're, they're, it's a situation where we're playing with people's lives sometimes it's a matter of calling in one person for overtime and it could open that station but they refuse to do that they are calling in people to work overtime to man the East Mountain station but I just don't know last night the chief admitted it was him that, that uh, decides which stations close or which you know when they're open when they're closed however I, I don't know on what basis they utilize that but it's a disaster waiting to happen and, and we're trying to nip it in the bud before it does happen but I did state that the uh, you know the fire stations on the west side are in, in, in pretty deplorable condition because of the vacancies you could imagine leaving your home at this time of the year to go somewhere for three four weeks at a time you know the creatures are coming in in from the cold and that's what's happening now last night the chief said they were going to have professional cleaners come in this week and um, you know I will be following up on that I'll be following up on the station uh, reopened he said he was going going to uh, reopen it again there was some confusion on if, if he has the determination to do it or is he have to, does he have to go through uh, the mayor but we even had a, a, a gentleman there who lives on Dewey Avenue that experienced a fire in his elderly mother's home and he was he was expecting the uh, fire truck from Luzerne Street to be right there and he waited and waited till they came from downtown you know seconds count in an emergency it's fortunate that there were no lives lost in that but <clears throat> how many times how many times are we going to spin the wheel and continue to hope that it doesn't happen because it's going to happen we've been very fortunate it'll be too late when when something drastic does happen and I know I've preached this many times I lived it I've seen it I worked the job I live in West Side. I live in an area where there is no water, no hydrants. I have an elderly woman that lives across the street from me, 85 years old. She lives alone. God forbid if her house is on fire, there's nothing they can do. There's no hydrants. By the time they climb that mountain and get around, that house, it, it's a tinderbox. It was built in the 20s, and, uh, or even earlier than that. This is what we're facing. You know, the population of the city may have gone down but the city's borders have expanded we've got construction farther and farther on the West Mountain on the East Mountain Montage Mountain farther areas for, for our equipment to run and we just you know again we're rolling the dice I don't know how long this can can go in our favor but we're rolling the dice on your lives we're rolling the dice on the lives of the firefighters and um, you know the chief said it's economics you know I don't know if that means we put a price on a life or what I, I don't want to read it that way but if it's economics but they had the economics 
they had that three and a half million dollars to man every station that was that was required you would have the full protection that you deserved we had two years to determine how we're going to offset it we could reapply in two years a number of firefighters would be retiring within that time so we wouldn't have to worry about uh, unemployment there are many things to look at in that two years but to gamble with lives in those two years really has me upset and I was a little upset at the meeting last night um, because I know the reality and the consequences of what can and and may happen and who's going to take the blame who's responsible you know I, I was told that uh, well City Council didn't put any overtime in for the fire department well we did put fire we put overtime in uh, they haven't even utilized all their overtime at this point we put overtime in for the police department. They've utilized probably three times what we put in. So why is it any different? Why can't they still use overtime? You know, we have other funds or, or discuss it with council, discuss it with, the, with us, the finance chair, the director of public, or the public safety uh, chairman, to find ways to protect you. That's what we're here for too. But when things are done unilaterally, like turning back three and a half million dollars without our knowledge till after the fact, that's a disgrace. That's one man making the decisions with your lives. And this is what's been going on here in this city. We're all supposed to be part of a team. Yes. We've batted back and forth. We don't always agree with the mayor, but we do agree to work together for your sake. And you've seen that example with the recovery plan. Mrs. Evans, Mr. Joyce worked real hard on that, along with our solicitor, to make a recovery plan that was going to be in the best interest of everyone. Were there some hard decisions in that recovery plan? Certainly. I have friends again, I have family, I have relatives, I have uh, elected officials in many of the surrounding areas that are good friends of mine that aren't too happy about the commuter tax. All we're asking is for a little bit of help for a couple of years. I know there's been a bad omen over this city for years, the black hole is talked about. I think the majority of people in this city have seen a change. There is more accountability. We haven't been able to do it overnight. We've been working hard for the last almost three years to turn something over that's been going away for, for 10 years. And we can't do it overnight. It's still going to take time. But I think you are starting to see some of the fruits of our work. Those that pay attention, not those that read, but those that pay attention to the meetings and speak to people on the street, they're the ones that see the reality of what we are doing here. But we are concerned about your, your pockets. Somebody mentioned how, how deep can we go in our taxpayers' pockets. That's why we looked at this recovery plan with many different facets, different revenue sources. It, it would have been easy to just say, yes, let's, let's just throw that 89% tax increase out there will be set. We have to get innovative. And if that requires asking our neighbors for some help at this time, and we're not the only ones in the state that do that. Reading, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, they all do it. Our situation's a little different. Different in the fact that, uh, you know, we have to apply each year for that. And we only have it in our recovery plan for three years. So with the right fiscal jurisprudence here, watching over the money that, that's coming in from that and designating it to where it should go, not to the black hole like it used to, I think we are able to turn this around. And it's going to be a benefit to not only our residents, but those people out of the city will benefit from a greater and stronger Scranton area. And by us being stronger, we'll be able to help those areas at times too. That's what it's about. 
They're our family. All the, resident, all the areas around here are part of the Scranton family. We happen to be the county seat. We happen to have a majority of, of non-taxable profits or non-taxable properties. Uh, and again, that's not something we can resolve overnight, but we are working on, on legislation and, and avenues to get money from the pilots. We're not alone in this, and there's been uh, other areas in the state where they've tried different things. And rather than us reinvent the wheel, we're working with these other areas to see what will work for everyone. But, you know, we have a lot of issues. We've been confronted with a lot of issues. A lot of issues financially. And, uh, you know, the issues about public safety. And, and someone mentioned the police cars before. I, I believe uh, I had mentioned a couple of years ago when we had found out that there was money coming in from the uh, landfill for equipment. And it was going to the DPW every year. And when we read the legislation, it said for public safety or, or whatever. And I, I believe I suggested at that time we could use that for police or, fi or fire vehicles. And I'm glad to see those four new police cars were purchased through that fund. So someone was listening to us. You know, you don't see us in photo opportunities in a newspaper every day. You know, first of all, you don't see many favorable comments about us in the newspaper. That's a given. But we sit here week after week, day after day, and do our jobs and do in our hearts what we feel is in the best interest of everyone here. Yet we see cartoons bashing us, we see editorials bashing us, and that's fine. You know, I don't like to call us politicians. We're you. We're one of you. We're here working for you. I've stated it before. Not one of us on this panel can give anybody jobs. We can't give out contracts. We're not like the other political entities around here where we could hire people, build buildings, set up contracts and all that. You come to one of our rallies, you won't see many contractors there or, or employees or anything like that because we don't have anything to give them. We're here working for the taxpayer. And I think this is one of the few elected bodies in this area that works specifically for the taxpayers we're providing you with your public safety, your police, your fire, your garbage pickup, your, your interconnection when you come to City Hall through our clerical workers and our offices here. But we're always looking at ways to help the taxpayer, reduce the tax burden, even though we've had to increase the taxes. But it's been a runaway for years. That's been a hard decision. Very hard decision. We're here to make the hard decisions, and uh, you know we're going to continue, and we're going to continue to fight for you. We're not going to give up. We don't need the glory of our picture in a paper every day. We don't need the glory of, of you know, headlines or anything like that. Our glory is going to be a few years down the road when we can see this city turned around because we demanded accountability. We demanded transparency, and we are and will continue to work our butts off for you. And you could lash at us all you want. You could talk about different ways of, of, of resolving problems in the city, but I think between the five of us here, we put our collective heads together, and, and we've worked out these issues to the best of our ability. And. You know, we have to go with that. I would hope that you elected us with that belief that we can lead this city out of the, the, the problems we've had. And I personally feel we have. Even though you won't read about it every day. But I can go to sleep at night knowing the decisions that we made here. And it's not I. We're a team. And we may not agree on every issue here. I've stated this before, you know, I'm married 33 years. I don't know if me and my wife agree on half the things, but 
were together 33 years and we made it work. And that's what we're doing here. We may have different ideas, but once you put your heads together and come up with a consensus that that's going to be the best way to do it, that's what happens. It's easy to second guess us. It's easy to blast us for raising taxes. It's easy to blast us for uh, commuter taxes. But had some of our ideas been put into place three years ago when we first suggested them, we'd be in a much better position now. Perhaps if those employers that employ the majority of out-of-town people and our nonprofits would have contributed more over the years, perhaps we wouldn't have to go after the commuters. It's a tough decision. We had a mixed bag. We had to work it out with the recovery plan. And uh, I believe, all in all, with everything that we've put together, in the next couple of years, we're going to be able to sit back and say, the tide has turned. The city has changed. There is accountability. There are watchdogs here. It hasn't been easy for the last two and a half years. And it's not going to be easy for the next four years. But we didn't get up here to be easy. We didn't get up here for an easy job. We came up here because our hearts are in this city. I have children and grandchildren, and hopefully great-grandchildren, that I want to see live in this city. I've been here all my life, and uh, I plan to be here the rest of my life. So I sleep good at night knowing that the decisions I made are in the best interest of everyone overall. We will get flack. We're used to that. But I just wanted to explain where we're coming from. Your tax dollars are here to pay for your public safety, your police protection, your fire protection, your garbage, your clerical workers, and, uh, and hopefully good government. And I don't want to be tainted by any problems that we've had prior in government or anything like that. I wasn't part of it. I want to be part of the new government, the government that we've tried to change here. If we didn't bring up the, uh, the issues with the parking authority, yet again, as you see, they've rolled that over and tried to blame us for the position the employee, some of the employees are in now. They're going to play this game for a little bit more. But yet you'll see some of those employees and maybe one of the executives will end up on his feet somewhere else with another position in another government body within the city with no loss whatsoever. They have $100 people running the administration now, and, and $10 an hour people are, have to, are told they have to sue to get their back pay. It's a disgrace. This is the good old boy network. And I, believe me, I said before, we have no jobs to give out or anything. I've lost more myself and family members by being in this position than anyone has ever gained. I've been, there's been retribution to myself and my family members from other political, I, good old boys, I may, may, may as well say, uh, that will someday, someday be cleared up. But, you know, I believe in God. I believe what I'm doing is right, and uh, I believe that should be the end of my sermon tonight. But God bless you all, and we're here for you. Thank you. Thank you. And if I might just um, suggest, though, uh, just as we all came together to mitigate the Supreme Court award and to um, address a contract and provide security for the citizens of Scranton for the coming years. Wouldn't it be possible, say, for yourself, maybe some members of the fire department, the fire chief, the mayor, uh, to work together with what we have right now, the, the number of men we have, the equipment that we currently possess, you know, can we be utilizing it in a manner in which it will provide more uh, equitable coverage 
and uh, you know rather than I, I think what what often happens is we all know what's wrong and we talk about it and talk about it but nothing much changes and I think maybe the best route to take here would be to see if there's a way where these two sides would come together and say this is how we can maybe use the manpower more effectively or by maybe moving around this equipment we can use we can use it more efficiently and effectively so if maybe you could try to uh, bring those parties together sure and I and I agree I mean this this was something that was touched on by uh, one of the uh, commentators last evening and uh, as you said I mean working with the administration we've been able to resolve some issues and, and I do believe you know with the chief being there last night the deputy chief our union officials uh, myself and the mayor I believe we can sit down because in in those negotiations over the Supreme Court uh, issues there was a, a pretty good consensus between the union and the administration that we would try to resolve these issues before they really went into arbitrations or you know the, the upper level grievance procedures and all that and, and I think you know that the tide has turned on that we've been working on that um, there is a there is a cooperation going on and and that will definitely be my goal I will uh, stop down City Hall tomorrow and try and get in touch with the mayor and the chief and, and our uh, leaders of the unions, police and fire, and uh, see what we can do. Definitely. It will be a benefit for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Loscombe. And Councilman Joyce, do you have comments or motions tonight? I do. Some time ago on August 15th, the five-year capital budget was sent on the council for years 2013 to 2017. The original capital budget that was sent to us by the administration included four sections, being fire stations and equipment, bridges, roads, curbs, and sidewalks, building improvements, and the park system. The original capital budget sent down by the administration in this while well, in the capital budget, the projected cost for fire stations and equipment was $2.5 million. The projected cost for bridges, roads, curbs, and sidewalks was $3 million. The projected cost for building improvements was $1.5 million. And the projected cost for the park system was $7 million. This is a grand total of $14 million. The funding for projects in the capital budget that was sent down by the administration was to come from grants and contributions, one-time revenue sources, and operating transfers from other funds. None of the funding in the, in the, for the projects in the capital budget was to be funded from long-term debt. The capital budget that was sent down by the administration went through the first two readings and was later tabled. This legislation was tabled to obtain suggestions for amendment by council members and also to obtain suggestions for creating a priority order of projects. I've received some suggestions from council members, however, not all council members offered suggestions. Tonight I'm going to make a motion in seventh order to take the capital budget off the table. Out of the council members that offered suggestions for the for the capital budget, the top priority was bridges, roads, curbs, and sidewalks. As improvements are needed within the city of Scranton's infrastructure, projects related to bridges, roads, curbs, and sidewalks may include, but are not limited to, street resurfacing, bridge reconstruction, and sidewalks, obviously. The second priority for the capital budget was tied between building improvements and fire stations and equipment making them duly important. As one may or may not know, there are eight fire stations in the city of Scranton. The fire stations are in need of renovations and repair. In addition, certain major equipment and apparatus will need to be replaced. Renovations and repairs need to take place. Along with this, improvements are needed for buildings owned by the city of Scranton. This includes City Hall, the DPW complex, and police headquarters. Building improvement projects may 
include, but are not limited to City Hall improvements such as general maintenance to the exterior of City Hall, new electrical wiring, and the replacement of the elevator located inside of City Hall, which we all know, especially those sitting in the audience, is in definite need of repair. The third and final priority for the capital budget was the park system. Within the park system, the first priority viewed by council members who responded to me was the construction of replacement fields and facilities for the south side complex. The second priority was the Kapaus Avenue pool. The third priority was the Novembrino pool complex. The fourth priority was Weston Field. The fifth priority was Weston Park. And finally, the sixth priority was Nayog Park. Out of all the council members that responded to me, there were certain projects within the park system that were not a priority and that were not wanted. For instance, the installation of splash parks was not a project that was wanted. This was originally in the capital budget for the Kapaus Avenue pool and the Novembrino pool. Instead of installing splash parks, it was a suggestion of council members that responded to repair the pools in these parks instead. Also in addition, it was suggested by city council members to not install security cameras since the security cameras that are currently in place in some city parks are not being monitored at all. Along with this, it was suggested by council members that lighting be removed from Weston Park and Weston Field and instead just to maintain the lighting systems that are currently in place. Also, it was suggested by council members that the garages not be installed and instead the garages that are in place be maintained at Weston Field and Nayog Park. All in all, with the cuts being made to the capital budget for the park system, it was suggested that the amount of money to be spent if grants and contributions are to be received be reduced from $7 million to $5 million. With this in mind, it was suggested by council members that revenue from one-time revenue sources be eliminated from the capital budget as it was the thought of council members that responded to me that if one-time revenue sources are realized in the upcoming years, they should be spent on general city operating expenses or to create a surplus or even pay down debt. This amounts to a total of $1.5 million. Moving on to the 2013 budget, with the budget season fast approaching, I've been informed that our business administrator, Ryan McGowan, has sent out worksheets to each of the respective department heads. Mr. McGowan has asked that each of the department heads reduce their spending in order that the, er, in their respective departments by at least 10% at their discretion. And furthermore, that if their spending is not reduced, that the business administrator's office would make the cuts. The reduction of departmental expenditures is necessary for the implementation of the revised recovery plan as departmental expense reductions have been included as part of the plan. Finally, there's been some reported opposition to the commuter tax by council speakers and especially by the newspaper has been documented recently. To remind, the commuter tax is an integral part of the recovery plan. If Scranton is not granted a commuter tax, it will have a negative effect on the real estate tax increase in the city of Scranton. In the city of Scranton, the commuter tax is proposed to generate $2.5 million in revenue if and when it is implemented for next year. If we did not obtain this $2.5 million in revenue, it would have to be made up in the operating budget. To provide a brief background, $139, a $139,000 increase in real estate tax revenue results in a 1% real estate tax increase for Scranton residents. If one does the math, $2.5 million divided by 139,000 results in a tax increase of 18% next year on top of a court-ordered 12% tax increase associated with the unfunded debt. Therefore, if the commuter tax is not granted, and if you're opposing the commuter tax, essentially, you may be in favor, 
blindly of increasing real estate taxes for Scranton residents by 30% rather than 12%. And that's all I have for tonight. Mrs. Evans, I'm sorry, I, I forgot one thing, if sure. it's possible. I, I happen to see in our mail uh, today a request for proposals, uh, professional architectural services. Uh, this is for Engine 9 Fire Station on North Main Avenue. It says, architectural services to develop plan specifications and contract documents for renovations of new overhead doors, man doors, and new windows for the City of Scranton's Fire Department Engine 9 building located at 1047 North Main Avenue. Provide general project management by attending meetings, approve shop drawings, answer questions during construction, inspection of final construction work, and approve all requests for payments by contractor. Uh, this is all well and good. Uh, this is something that's definitely needed, and I know the chief had mentioned that they were going to do something like this. But when I went around to the stations last week uh, with the situation that, that we've had with the uh, mice and stuff like that, Engine 9 especially stood out. Um, I believe that we need more than windows and doors there. I believe that there's some structural deficits and there should be an engineer to check that out first. The rear door does not open or close at all because there's settlement in the building. There's large cracks. The front facade is pulling away. Uh, the block at the top on the driveway side of the building is caving in. Um, the glass in the back is cracked from settling. So I don't believe it would be prudent to put in new windows and have them crack two weeks later because there's still more settlement. It's, it's like spending bad money after, or good money after bad. Um, my suggestion is, is that they have a structural engineer uh, look at this building before they issue these contracts for the, the windows and doors because there may have to be some other work done on those buildings. I know all of the buildings need some work, but Engine 9 more specifically has definite structural deficits that have to be addressed before cosmetic work is completed. And, and it's the same thing I happen to see many times, and, and I know what would happen. Uh, let's get it straightened out now before it costs us three times as much. How many times we have homes on our demolition list, and there's bids put out. Then we get the, the revisions. It's time after time, and I don't know why they don't do it, if, if, but time after time we get revisions where they... The, the person that uh, received the contract gets an increase of four or five thousand dollars here, two thousand dollars there, because there was uh, asbestos in the property they were tearing down. I think that should be investigated before those structures are put out to bid. I mean, that, that's my opinion, but it, it's simple to do. Have, have, have somebody, I mean, I believe we have inspectors in the city, they could go in and tell you it's asbestos and it has to be abated before it comes down. But time after time after time, I think just about every demolition group that we've had so far, there's been revisions to pay extra to have asbestos abated. Let's know up front what it's gonna be. Maybe another one of those other bidders would have been cheaper, including the asbestos removal. That's my opinion on that, but I could see that happening with, the, with Engine 9 put all those windows in and then they start popping again and the doors don't close. It could, be, it could end up being a lot more costly. But it, it, it's you know, a little more prudent to do a little more investigating before we jump into something like this. And not that it's not sorely needed, but let's spend the money wisely. So I would suggest we send a, a, a letter to uh, OECD requesting that they have an engineer uh, check this building before any of this work is uh, approved. Mr. Lasko, may I suggest we send one to the city engineer and Certainly. ask him? I'm, I'm sorry, that's, that's, that's all. Fine. Thank you. Good evening. <clears throat> Following the publication of the fees included in previous 2012 debt financing, I requested similar information for all bond issues, TANs, letters of credit, leasebacks, and borrowing that occurred from 2002 through 2011. 
In response, Mr. Henry Salusti, Managing Director of RBC Capital Markets, LLC, provided a complete list of fees and expenses charged by various companies relating to bond series A, B, C, and D of 2003, all of which were paid from the proceeds of the bonds. Among the numerous fees included in the correspondence are the following. Financial advisor's fee of $106,666.63, bond counsel fees of $100,000, and underwriter's counsel fee of $50,000. The total of 2003 fees and expenses is $2,000,000. $176,503.94. Also in response to counsel's request, Mr. William Rhodes of Ballard Spar provided a chart that includes the billed fees related to city debt financing that were paid to Ballard Spar for a total of $224,150 for the years 2003 2004 and 2008. In addition, Mr. Brian P. Kozlansky of Stevens and Lee submitted closing statements from the four City of Scranton financings for which Stevens and Lee served as bond counsel. And I'm not going to read all of that, but just uh, I'll highlight some of uh, each year from December 22nd, 2004. We have uh, Stevens and Lee special counsel fee and expenses, 45,000. RBC Dane Rosher financial advisor fee, 25,000. Uh, Jeffrey J. Bellardi Esquire authority co-solicitor fee, 4,000. William V. Peters Esquire authority co-solicitor fee, 4,000. Pepper Hamilton LLP Authority Special Counsel Fee, 1,500. Uh, Ballard Spar Bank Counsel Fee and Expenses, 5,500. But, and there are, there's more, but the uh, total for December 22nd, 2004 is $93,000. In 2005, um, we have, again, Stevens and Lee, 30,000, RBC Dane Rosher, 15,000, Jeff Bellardi, um, co-solicitor, 4,000, James Mulligan, Esquire, authority, co-solicitor, 4,000, Ballard Spar, 3,500, and a few more for a total of 67,500. Then in 2006, um, we have Stevens and Lee bond council fees and expenses um, for a total of sixty thousand three hundred sixty-two fifty. The Cummings Law Firm six thousand. McGrath Law Firm six thousand. Carl Greco five thousand, and there are more. And that's a total of ninety-two thousand sixty-four dollars and fifty cents. And then finally, in two thousand eight. We have um, Stevens and Lee bond council fees and expenses for fifty fifty-eight thousand um, dollars. Ballard Spar twenty thousand. Cozen O'Connor special counsel to the city twenty-seven thousand five hundred. Carl Greco uh, seven thousand. Uh, the Redevelopment Authority of the City of Scranton, 10000 for an authority fee. And that grand total, because there are many more, it comes to $202,936.90. So the total of billed fees paid for these four financings in 2004, 5, 6, and 8 is $455,501.40. To date, these are the firms who responded. All fees, with the exception of $31,000 paid by the city post-closing in 2003 for post-issuance escrow restructurings, appear to have been paid from the proceeds of their respective financings. 
Because all of these billed fees and expenses may not have been made public by the local newspaper and the administration from 2003 through 2008, it is important to provide information to the taxpayers regarding all city financings, not only those that occurred this year. Financing requires the work of multiple firms and their councils, all of whom are compensated for their time and effort. Next, I believe we received copies of the city's noise ordinance this week, and I ask that all council members, and particularly Mr. Loscombe, public safety chair, would review it as I will, and propose any amendments that may be needed to stop boom cars from blasting music on city streets 24-7. I'll also forward to you, Mr. Loscombe, uh, a website that contains valuable information and procedures implemented in other cities to address this type of constant nuisance. Thank you. um, you're welcome. Uh, I spoke with the mayor earlier today, as I noted during citizens participation, and he stated that the heat has been turned back on at the Engine 2 fire station. UGI said it was their mistake and they apologized for the inconvenience. Also, I'm pleased to report that the street light installation request at Lafayette Street and Boylan Avenue was approved by the city engineer this week. He directs Mr. Dewar, DPW director, to coordinate its installation with the appropriate parties. In addition, the administration hopes to submit legislation to halt truck traffic on Lake Scranton Road to City Council for placement on next week's agenda. And finally, I have but one citizen's request for the week. Residents of Cedar Avenue request the posting of a speed limit sign in the 300 or 400 block of Cedar Avenue. They report daily speeding on this road. And that's it. Prior to going to sixth order, could I just one mm -hmm. last thing, uh, personal. Uh, just a congratulations to my niece, Mary Claire Hopkins, uh, recently um, honored for 20 years of working with United Neighborhood Centers and Project Hope and their Head Start program. But I didn't want to mention that. So Thank you. Yes, and congratulations from all of council. Mrs. Craig, 5B, approving the transfer of a restaurant liquor license currently owned by Kalani's Incorporated, trading as Little Nikki's Pasta House, 77 Fallbrook Street, Carbondale, PA, 18407, license number R-14028, to Pass Rush, LLC, for use at Big House Tobacco Outlet, located at 200 Greenridge Street, Scranton, PA, 18509, as required by the Pennsylvania Liquor Control Board. At this time, I'll entertain a motion that item 5B be introduced into its proper committee. So, so second. On the question? All those in. I, I just, uh, I'm not familiar with Big House Tobacco Outlet and why they would need a, oh, it's for. Is it for the tobacco outlet, or is it for the pasta? No, it's transfer. Yes. Yeah, Why would they need a liquor license? You might. Must be looking to I expand. I would think that this is a uh, probably it's a um, delicatessen license where they could sell up to two six packs of beers, uh, beer, um, and up to four quarts of beer at a time. I I, I don't know if that's what it is, but. It seems that if it's coming from Little Nicky's Pasta House, that would be a restaurant license. Yeah, it says transfer restaurant liquor license. Unless they're going to, if, if it's a restaurant liquor license, they're going to have to have so many tables and everything uh, in order to meet the requirements of the Liquor Control Board. And it would seem that they'd have to run a restaurant there. I mean, that's the rules of the Liquor Control Board. Uh, mm -hmm. But it could be looked into. I, I haven't seen the legislation to support it, but. Uh, you know what the what the write-up is, but uh, who, whoever the lawyers are, uh, it could be a 
letter written to them and also to be on the PLCB application. I, I don't know what the supporting documentation is on this. This is just for introduction, so right. I'm, I'm we can do the willing to vote it, you know, to introduce it, but I think we should find out what the what the purpose is. I agree. All those in favor? Since it's coming from Carbondale into Scranton, you know, we have to approve it, you know, from the transfer from that municipality to this municipality. Right. Mm -hmm. All those in favor of introduction, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so moved. Sixth order, 6A, reading by title, file of council number 63, 2012, in ordinance. Amending file of the council number 46, 2012, in ordinance entitled, amending file of council number 33, 2012, entitled, establishing a no parking zone in the 900 block of North Washington Avenue, State Route 3023, on the westernmost side of said street, pursuant to the highway occupancy permit application of the Commonwealth Medical College from State Route 3023, segment 90, offset 1000 to State Route 3023, segment 90, offset 1219, for a distance of 219 feet to correct the incorrectly identified segment numbers of State Route 3023 to correct the incorrectly identified offset numbers for the no parking zone. You've heard reading by title of item 6A. What is your pleasure? I move that item 6A pass reading by title. Second. On the question? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so moved. Seventh order, seven. Oh. Before we begin seventh order, I'd like to make a motion to appoint Jack Loscombe as temporary chairperson for community development. Uh, we have a motion on the floor. Do we have a second? Can we second this? Uh, second. Oh, second. <laughs> All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so move. 7A, for consideration by the Committee on Community Development for Adoption, Resolution Number 44, 2012, authorizing the Mayor and other appropriate city officials for the City of Scranton to enter into a loan agreement and make a loan from the Community Development Block Grant Program, Project Number 150.35, in an amount not to exceed $150,000 to 520 Madison Avenue Associates, LLC, to assist an eligible project. What is the recommendation of the Chair for the Committee on Community Development? As Acting Chairperson for the Committee on Community Development, I recommend final passage of Item 7A. Second. On the question? It's just on the question, uh, as Mrs. Shoemaker uh, brought out, uh, if we could just make sure that the, uh, this loan is made out to the proper entity. You know, if our solicitor can check on that or is more there work for you, Boyd. I, I would think that, I mean, this is OECD. I mean, I'll, I'll look into it, but uh, if you pass it tonight, it, it, it's passed. I mean, the only thing you could do is table it until next week to see uh, and have OECD. You know, I'll, I'll look into it. But you can't pass it and then look into it and then... I think the only thing you could do is really table it and take uh, take a look at it next week. Um, well, can I? It's up for final adoption tonight. Can I make Once a motion to table now? Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah, based on that question, uh, just so we do have an accurate uh, entity, I am uh, going to vote to ta or make a motion to table this till we can uh, check that out with the OECD next week for next week. We have a motion to table item 7A. Do we have a second? Second. On the question? Uh, I, I guess I don't under, maybe I just don't see what the problem is. And you know, we have all of the backup and it, you know, the names are consistent. Um, I, I, we're just you know, putting off an inevitable. And I think what the problem is, as Ms. Schumacher stated, is that you know, I, I don't know how accurate it is that it, it, what she checked 
there's no such entity on with the corporate bureau is 520 Madison Avenue Associates LLC. Now, I don't know if it's going to be formed. I don't know if she did the search right, but if there's no such entity, how could the city make a loan? I think that's what her question right. was. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly that, that if this is who the loan is being made to and it doesn't exist, you know, one week isn't going to matter. We can find out who it is. I don't even know who the attorneys are or anything like this. Um, All right. Understood. Yes, just for legal clarification. Definitely. Understood. Uh, I would think that OECD should have checked all of that out to make sure that they, that it is that, that it is a vi that it is a LCC that it, that it is registered and it is you know an LLC that's registered with Pennsylvania. Okay. Uh, all those in favor of tabling item seven A signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed. The ayes have it, and so moved. Item 7A is tabled. 7B, for consideration by the Committee on Community Development for Adoption, Resolution Number 45, 2012, authorizing the Mayor and other appropriate City officials for the City of Scranton to enter into a loan agreement and make a loan from the Community Development Block Grant Loan Program, Project Number 150.34, in an amount not to exceed $150,000 to Freckles and Frills Incorporated to assist an eligible project. What is the recommendation of the chair, the acting chair for the Committee on Community Development? As acting chairperson for the Committee on Community Development, I recommend final passage of item 7B. Second. On the question, um, as uh, I noted last week, uh, the taxes, the delinquent taxes were paid for um, the 520 Madison Avenue Associates LLC. Um, we also received, however, during the week notification from OECD that taxes for freckles and frills are also up to date and we did receive copies of uh, the receipts for payment. And I thank OECD. I know last week, I believe I mentioned that we would like that to be looked into for each one of the loans, and we'd like council to be notified prior to placing the loans on the agenda, and we require the proof of payment. Uh, is there anyone else on the question? Roll call, please. Mr. McGough? Yes. Mr. Austin? Yes. Mr. Joyce? Yes. Mrs. Evans? Yes. I hereby declare item 7B legally and lawfully adopted. I would like to make a motion to take file of council number 54, 2012 from the table. Second. On the question, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so moved. 7C, the consideration by the Committee on Finance, Council, November 24, 2012, previously tabled, approving and accepting the City of Scranton capital budget for the year 2013, pursuant to Section 904 of the City's Home Rule Charter. <clears throat> I make a motion to amend item 7C as per the following changes. 2013 capital budget number one insert on page two under park system one south side complex construction of replacement field and facilities number two under western field delete new garage new showmobile new lighting number three under western park delete new or security cameras and new lighting Delete Connell Park security cameras, number four. Number five, under Kapouse Avenue pool, after demolish, delete pool and, delete install splash park and insert repair pool. Under Novembrino pool, after demolish, delete pool and, 
delete install splash park and insert repair pool. Under Nailog Park, delete new garage, security cameras, new filtration system building. After projected cost, delete seven and insert five. After total, delete 14 million and insert 12 million. On page four, capital fund improvement plan budget spreadsheet. In row four, column C, delete 1.5 million. In row 4, column F, delete 1 million. In row 4, column G, delete 500,000. In row 7, column C, delete 2 million and insert 1.5 million. In row 7, column E, delete 500,000. In row 13, column C, delete 14 million and insert 12 million. In row 13, column E, delete 2.5 million and insert 2 million. In row 13, column F, delete 2.5 million and insert 1.5 million. In row 13, column G, delete 5 million and insert 4.5 million. On page 5, capital fund improvement plan budget spreadsheet. In row 12, column C, delete 7 million and insert 5 million. And in row 12, column G, delete 3.5 million and insert 1.5 million. In row 13, column C, delete 7 million and, in, and insert 5 million. In row 13, column G, delete 3.5 million and insert 1.5 million. In row 16, column C, delete 14 million and insert 12 million. In row 16, column G, delete 5 million and insert 3 million. Second. On the question? Yes. Uh, I know Mr. Joyce mentioned the uh, deleting of the security cameras. Um, I think in, in the capital budget, uh, security cameras are just a way of protecting the investment that you're making. And for the, you know, this, what I would consider probably be a small cost in each of these areas to install cameras that um, I, I think that they should be, that should be reinstated for the various parks. Since vandalism at those places is one of the major, major problems, um, I think security cameras in the capital budget would be um, a good idea. Um, the only thing uh, in, in the way of a response I, I could make is that um, as we're all aware, the city has had security cameras. And that program was very unsuccessful and a, a waste of taxpayers' money. I don't know who'd be watching these cameras because, uh, as I said, the, the cameras that were installed throughout the downtown previously, that, that was another project that went belly up so as much as you know I, I do appreciate what you're saying uh, I think the city is in such dire financial circumstances that it that it really has to um, try to manage what can be done and in what stages it can be done and when all is said and done <laughs> this capital budget quite frankly is nothing more than a wish list and which is why I thought that taking them out was unnecessary. That since we're not voting to spend money to do it at this point in time, I, I just believe the security cameras are a good idea and should be considered in the future when we do make the capital improvements. That was all. And, you know, and it and can be added at the time. I'm I, I hope that can be done and I hope we will have people will have the money to do so and we're going to have the um, manpower assigned to Understood. actually monitoring it. Anyone else on the question? All those in favor of the motion to amend item 7C signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so moved. What is the recommendation of the chairperson for the Committee on Finance? As chairperson for the Committee on Finance, I recommend final passage of item 7C. 
As amended. Second. On the question. Roll call, please. Mr. Rugoff? Yes. Mr. Laskum? Yes. Mr. Joyce? Yes. Mrs. Evans? Yes. I hereby declare item 7C as amended, legally and lawfully adopted. If there's no further business, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. This meeting is adjourned.